everybody, I'm Beebs Kelly. I've been keeping you waiting, not on purpose, but I have. For all the newsworthy fashion moments that we have endured from the Meg. As everyone knows, the Meg had one of the most embarrassing moments to date on the red carpet and one of the weirdest outfits to date on the red carpet. I mean, it's not as bad as the red nightmare boob disaster, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Maybe she'll top it. I don't know. Maybe that one will forever be her most notorious and terrible outfit. I'm not sure. Before we get into the outfit, this was actually last year's invite, but because Queen Elizabeth II had just passed away on September 8th, she missed it or just like canceled her appearance. I'm not sure what date they held it last year, what month they held it in, but, but because she missed the event last year, she was invited or allowed to come this year, apparently. So it's actually kind of old news, so to speak, that she's there. She's not one of the honorees. She's not presenting. She's not doing anything. So there was no actual need for her to be there besides WME and their whole PR machine situation. She wore the Proenza Schuler dress. I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. Naturally, it's in beige. And we have so many problems with this dress, you guys. It's awful. What she did when wearing it is maybe worse than the dress itself. I'm not sure. Where to begin? Deep breaths. That's where we start. We start with deep breaths because this is utterly absurd. This is called the Rosa dress. Now, I found a black version and a beige leather version. I have not found for sale the exact one that the Meg wore. So perhaps it's last year's dress. Perhaps... She had it made in beige for her, I don't know. But if she had it made in beige, then you'd think it would fit a lot better. So I'm not sure where she got the beige one. First off, it's a midi dress. So that's problem numero uno. It's not supposed to be floor length, let alone puddling up on the floor the way it is here. It's supposed to be above the ankles at least. By definition, any dress that's above the ankles but below the knees is a midi dress. It's a mid-calf length that is flexible depending on your height, body shape, and the fashion statement the person is trying to make or the designer is trying to make. This particular dress, verbatim, is described by the designer as a color block off the shoulder slits hem midi dress. Quite the mouthful features color block lining. That's this white lining, which makes much more sense in this black version here on the model than it does in the beige, like Meg wore it. It doesn't work the same in beige. I mean, cream and white can go with beige, but they're not the match made in heaven Megan wants them to be. And it also has these slit hems. It's an off-the-shoulder neckline with short sleeves and an A-line silhouette. The hem falls below the knee, the designers are known for technical sophistication and modern luxury, unlike the Meg. So the biggest question everybody has is, is it meant to be off the shoulder? Yes, but look at the differences here. The model's dress fits. It's not too long. It doesn't have a bunch of excess length to it at all. And it's not too big. It fits properly. The Meg's has too much room in some places, way too much length in other places, and has this big bulge at the back. This gives an unintentional look to the dress. It makes it look sloppy and messy, like it's hanging off her shoulder, not meant to be off the shoulder. There's a big difference because this is not helped along by the fact that the seam goes wonky. In the model and the mag, though it's much more dramatic in the mags, the seam curves. It's not straight. It should be straight. It should. It makes it look screwy. If they had kept the seam straight in the design or, or kept it to darker colors where you wouldn't notice that the seam curves off, then it would have been much more successful. But since they didn't do that, I've said it so often, if it doesn't look intentional from afar or on camera or in a picture or in person, then it will look like a mistake. And that's what happened here. So that's in part Megan's fault because she's wearing one that's not fitting her correctly, which we're about to get into, but it's also in part the designer's fault for not creating the dress in a way where the seams were straight and thus would read to us intentionally off the shoulder rather than mistakenly slouching and falling off the shoulder. Megan, you need to hem your clothes. This is it getting embarrassing. It, it must need to be said again because she's still doing this puddling up on the floor. 
What? Since it's meant to be midi length, she likely buys up one or two sizes to fit the width of her torso, which is necessary, like that's normal. But it makes it even more important and essential that she hems her clothes because that means they will always be at least a little bit longer than they were meant to be from the designer's side of things. And this is not unique to somebody who has a boxy torso like Megan or who lacks a well-defined waist like Megan. It's not exclusive to her or people with those exact body type concerns. It's something that so many people deal with in so many different shapes and sizes. This specific case, it is likely contributing heavily to the excessive length, that boxier torso needing a size up. So literally the only solution to this would be to have it hemmed. That's the only solution here, and she didn't do it. It should have been hemmed to above the ankles. Otherwise, this is not the same intention that the designers had whatsoever. The split hem thing is something that I, like, do not like. I've never liked split hems much at all. Um, I really, I've yet to see a splits hem dress that I like and that I think looks, like, really nice. They just tend to look a little bit messy. The fabric ends up just kind of hanging. It like takes away from the flowiness of a skirt when it has the split hems and they just kind of hang there. Then if you spin, you resemble a windmill. So I just really don't like split hems. They're chunky, they look awkward, especially in movement. But you know what's never made a split hem look any better at all? having it puddle up on the floor. Also, since it was designed as a midi, so much of how the garment will lay and hang off of the body, the skirt shape, the design elements, even the A-line shape that they intended it to have, are dependent on the length. Chop it shorter than it's meant to, or wear it longer than it's meant to, or insanely longer where it's puddling up on the floor like this, you're compromising all these other elements of the dress. It's not just a tad long, no big deal. It literally has a domino effect up to a certain point that throws the entire dress look off. We have what appears to be an accidentally askew top and a severely disheveled looking bottom at the wrong length for the design. What other treasures doth this garment hold? Back bulge. What is that? What is happening? You should never have this big poofy bulge in the back of a dress or a garment. It's never going to look nice. This is not meant to be happening. Not that it needs to be said. The dress is tight along her waist area, but it's not the right length. So we have this extra length in the top half here, which has nowhere to go but out in a hump on her back. And she's short-waisted too, which is exacerbating this situation, but it's accentuating the improper fit that this dress has so much, it's crazy. And she also doesn't have a smooth finish over her torso, which is making it very distracting at the waistline. Like, your eye just ends up resting right there at the waistline area, at the waistband, and accentuating how rectangular her body type is. Or square, rather, because she's a short rectangle, then that's a square. Geometry. It also looks like it's supposed to have a faux tuck and evoke the idea of a jumpsuit in a way in terms of the design concept here. Like looking at these models, they have almost like a blousing to this top half that the Meg didn't bother to check on or do. So I don't particularly like it or anything, but it's just another example of her not wearing it properly. She had done that and created that blousing effect. It may have helped to minimize the hump on the back from happening. And that's literally only happening because there's so much length to the torso that she doesn't have. They do not match. They do not go. I don't like how it makes one boob look saggy either, but my favorite comment from one of you guys was that the Meg left one of her boobs home on this day. It totally looks like that. Overall, I don't really care for the dress, in large part due to that crooked center seam, leaving us guessing if it's meant to be off the shoulder or not when after looking at the original designs, it clearly is. We should be able to immediately tell if it's meant to be off the shoulder or not. So it's just not a good design element. And then the split hems, like, I just don't particularly like this dress. But one positive that it has is that the draped asymmetrical neckline is good. It brings some welcome softness to her shoulder line and square torso. It's not exaggerating her shoulder width at all. It's complementing it. So that part of it is really good. But 0% of the rest of it is okay at all.
The hairstyle I think was fine for the outfit. The small earrings and her makeup also seemed fine to me in the pictures that I saw. Somehow it exaggerated her longer arms and shorter torso though with the length of the sleeves. They almost remind me of like dolman sleeves um, and the jewelry. It just kind of combined, ex exaggerated the length of her arms visually Not a and the shorter torso also seems a little exaggerated. I'm not 100% sure how she accomplished that in this like just beige tablecloth, but somehow she did. I looked through like all the other red carpet arrivals and there was a lot more color. There was a lot of really weird outfits that were just kind of quirky. It seems like a little bit of a chaotic event where there's no real aesthetic that people understand for it because it's just kind of like this random, somewhat obscure awards show it's not terribly obscure because we do have some big actors there, but it was just a real mixed bag when it came to the fashion. But I definitely think that she should have gone for something a little bit brighter or more exciting of a color, but definitely something that would have been hemmed properly would have been a necessity here. If she's gonna do an ugly dress, the least she could do is hem them. It was meant to be off the shoulder. If the designer had had that seam be straight and it was a little bit less dramatically so on the Meg, it would have helped. She should have done the blousing thing or had the dress shortened in the torso and in the length overall. That would have eliminated the big hump in the back and the puddling on the floor. This looked so comically sloppy, I couldn't even believe it. I was like shocked and surprised that somebody would wear it. And I think that the cream beige combo. Honestly, just something about it is not working at all. And then she has black accessories. Why not do white accessories? If the lining is white, why not do white shoes and white handbag? On to what happened in the dress. Who in their right mind? When I saw what happened, I could not handle it. I couldn't believe my eyes. Epically embarrassing. You've all seen it by now. The Meg couldn't get off the red carpet. She couldn't do it. Her assistant or somebody's assistant tries to push her along because she is told by an organizer that the time is up. There's people there in charge of this coordinating the whole thing. And so this assistant that we see on camera was told by somebody off to the side, you got to get Meg out of here. It's her time is up. It's time to move on. So she's just trying to do what she's told to by the organizers whose job is to facilitate the pace at which these celebrities go. So the Meg was confronted with an already terrible situation for her. She was clearly not aware enough to use her peripherals to see the assistant coming towards her. As soon as she saw the assistant start to inch this way, she should have gracefully just been like, oh, this is my decision to be done here with taking pictures and start to move on. That would have been the only way and the only chance she had at making this look intentional, on purpose, her idea, stay in control of the situation and her image. And she blew it because she was just either too obsessed with the cameras and not paying attention to her peripherals or she didn't care. I mean, there's nothing wrong with ever leaving photographers or, or people in general, leaving them wanting more, keeping that little bit of mystery, you know, never looking desperate. That's a really good thing in terms of becoming popular with the public because they want more. They want to see more of you. They want to hear more from you because you're not overdoing it and you're not staying past your welcome ever. You're always kind of just like real quick, you know, oh yeah, here's my pictures, but you know, this isn't really what I'm here for. So I'm moving on quickly. It gives a totally different message than what the Megan did here. She did desperation personified. Megan Harold just don't seem to grasp this concept at all. On the contrary, they seem quite comfortable looking extremely desperate and oversharing. So she lost her chance at this being her idea and truly saving face and staying professional. She missed the social cues that, hey, you're about to be pushed out of here, get ahead of it, get out there ahead of it, in front of it, make it look like it was on purpose and your idea or whatever. She missed that, long gone, that ship sailed. No grace, no tact, out the window. So once the assistant actually came into frame, the Meg was faced with two 
options. Concede and be pushed along and just go ahead and be pushed onwards. It still would have been embarrassing, but she could have made some sort of little joke or laughed it off a little bit or something like that. I don't know. Say that the flashes, she was blinded by the flashes and didn't see you and, oh, okay, let's go now. You know, she could have tried to save face that way, but not come off as extremely desperate that way, at least. Or she could do what she did, which was essentially use your arm like a stick to keep the lady at bay and stay for longer until you decide that you're ready to leave, even though you've already been told it's time to move on. Way more embarrassing, in my opinion. Just go back to staring into the abyss of the very cameras she and Harold accused of being bothersome predatory even. Either option would have been really embarrassing, but I think this, uh, no, you stay away, I'm gonna take more pictures posed like creepy selfie faces is decidedly the worst option of the two. If she had just been pushed off and laughed it off, I mean, you know, maybe it would have been okay. But this, no amount of cackling or creepy smiles will erase it. We know already at this point there's been enough evidence compiled that she is very unaware no room reading spectacles in sight, camera hungry for sure. But this is also an example of what happens when somebody is quite high in narcissism and are threatened in some way, shape or form. They dig in their heels. She was aware enough to understand what the assistant was doing, trying to get her to move along because that was the instructions. And she's aware enough to understand how bad the situation was going to look. But for her, it's way better to dig in her heels and pretend like she's in charge of the situation and that, you know, she's just act like she's doing the right thing when she's clearly doing the most cringiest thing possible. Just plant those fugly shoes and take more pictures. I mean, it was just, to her, it was way better to extend picture smolder time further than to just accept the error and move on. It made her look way, way worse from a personality perspective that she would show such high cringe behavior. I read one article that said she recovered from it and styled it off well or something like that. I completely disagree with that. Um, this was bad. This looked awkward, cringy, secondhand embarrassment off the charts. It didn't save the moment in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't styled off well. Just going back to making r weird, creepy selfie faces and duck faces into the cameras is not playing it off. That's not the same thing. As for the interview moment, okay, how hard is it to answer the Christmas tradition question? How hard? Even somebody with no like discernible traditions who doesn't really know what to say at least has something reading Christmas picture books to your kiddos, you know, I don't know, hanging stockings, baking cookies, something. You can come up with something on the fly. Anybody can. Like sometimes younger people don't even realize that a lot of those things are actual traditions. They count as traditions. But like she's much older than I am and she has no excuse to not understand what constitutes a tradition and not. It was weird. Our little ones are still little, so we're just enjoying every moment of it, I believe is the quote. Uh-huh. Okay. How about dipping the toe into reality for a second? Been the same exact concept in a slightly more relatable and personable way, less like a robot. Started out with, my kids are still so little, you could go so many ways with it, that would make sense. Every part of the holidays is still new to them. All magical still. The kids are still experiencing some of their firsts for the Christmas holidays, so that's really special. Their favorite part is decorating. Like something so simple like that would have been human and normal. But no, we have this pathetic answer that doesn't really make any sense anywho. As for the intensity of her gaze into the reporter's soul or, or forehead rather, she read to me exactly like somebody who knew there was a camera next to them and wanted to try to look pretty. She was still using her selfie face. She was still pushing her lips out. She was more focused on how she looked than the person's questions or like forming a good answer. It was creepy. It was creepy. She looked like she was burning a hole in that woman's forehead. It was kind of weird. She kept doing these like squints, like she was glaring or squinting. I don't know what was happening. What, what was that? It was weird. And then of course, WME was sure to get a few pics of her with notable people, but not like famous faces. They did show her in the background at a different table behind the famous faces table. I assume Leonardo DiCaprio was at the famous faces table and she was back here, but they got a shot 
where you could see there's Leo and then there's the Meg, you know, this is WME. They're trying really hard. Here's the thing. I was speaking to someone who said, she's not even famous. So confused by the whole thing, like why she was even there or walking the red carpet at all. Because like some people, for example, some producers or directors choose not to walk the red carpet because they're not a famous face, so to speak. The red carpet is for those who people can recognize or, you know, fans of actors and singers and people like that. The faces of these things are who walk the red carpet. And so they were just kind of like confused. And I mean, it's true because she herself is not really all that famous in her own right. She just married someone who was famous, but not celebrity. So when she and when he joins too, but like, when she's there, she's really out of place. And it shows because she or they as a couple, they're not celebrities. She's not a famous actor. She's not famous for her acting. She's not a heavyweight producer or director or studio CEO. This is WME at work. And this is like exactly what I thought they would do. It still doesn't make her look any more integrated. It doesn't make her look like she fits in in these groups, which I'm not saying that that sounds like so rude. It's more so just if it doesn't make sense why you're there, then you probably shouldn't be there if it doesn't make sense. Or don't make a show of it. Don't walk the red carpet if there's no real good reason for you to be there. But WME's approach is a three-pronged one. The first being to get her and Harry seen more anywhere everywhere, doing things, regular appearances to really bulk up their portfolio of recognition, so to speak, their visibility level to really beef it up. Because people who aren't paying much attention, including some celebrities or people who, you know, work in Hollywood, they don't pay as close of attention to this saga that has been going on. But they will vaguely recall seeing them at Kevin Costner's fundraiser or at this obscure um, awards show that they're just assumed they don't know what that is, but it's an awards show. It must be important. It's a sneaky long game. The second prong is to get them seen near other celebrities or in the same headlines as other celebrities. So you have this as a perfect example. She was not standing next to these other big named famous faces but she's in the headlines next to them. Going to a Katy Perry concert or Beyonce or Taylor Swift, her name is next to those big names in the headlines. This picture of her in the background with Leo in the forefront, it's a sneaky association game. The third prong is repeatedly putting out that they've moved on from the palace drama because they've identified that as a big problem. It came off super negative, petty, whiny, plethora of lies. By consistently reminding the public that they are past the palace drama or that they're not mad anymore, they'd like to be invited to this or that, is a sneaky victim status game because it keeps them in this space of, oh, they're not the aggressors now. The headlines are never talking about things that Meghan and Harry are doing to anybody else. They're positioning them in a different light now. Sadly, Eventually, these types of tactics tend to work, at least some percentage of the target audiences. But cringe moments and awful clothes may just ruin WME's best efforts. I don't know. Time will tell. But ever since Spare, they've continued this slow, steady drip of statements that they're not going to talk about the royal family anymore. There's nothing left to say about the royal family. We're totally done making comments about the royal family. We have nothing left to say. We're over it. Megan's past the drama, all right? She's been past the drama for months now. Goal? It can only be to make people think that they are unbothered. Perhaps kind of like a toddler telling on themselves. Because we see this pattern. The royal family is in the media. They're doing good things. They're doing normal things. They have good press or normal press, just reporting on their state visits, things like that. Just normal stuff, right? They're just doing their thing and they're out there in the news and people love them. So they get good press. Having events, private or otherwise, it doesn't matter. Then, like clockwork, Harold and the Meg release petty into the media. Then statements like wanting to move back to Britain or wanting to be invited back to Christmas or the paparazzi shots walking around in Montecito that were saved for the king's birthday to be released. They release these things. That's their petty moment. It's like their tantrum moment. And then soon after, we are reminded some iteration of Harry and Meghan are past this stuff, you guys. Uh-huh. Sure seems like it, too. Exactly no one 
I think what really made everybody's eyes roll the hardest was Harry and Meghan would like to accept an invitation to Christmas. Harry is missing Christmas at home. This is clearly a bid from them to get said invite. To try to pressure the family into inviting them, I suppose, or just media games, just absurd and pathetic. The couple who complained that others use the press to communicate have, it would appear, exclusively been using the press to communicate with their family on private matters since 2019. This is the same. It gets more and more see-through every time. Your first step, obviously, everybody knows, should be calling or emailing or writing letters to the family. But no, it's the media. It's just, it's silly at this point, and it is undignified. I'm sure they do want to be invited back for the holidays, and then some, but they literally cannot be trusted, and the holidays are not the time or the place for the first reunion, so to speak. So it's honestly even more tone-deaf and self-centered for them to try to use the holidays as a vehicle, a time where hard-working, busy parents finally take some time off to be with their kids and extended family. It's their turn and time to be joyous and have fun and be merry, literally not have tension and meetings, and a meeting would certainly be in order before any festivus can take place, with even a pinch of fun involved. Otherwise, things would be just icy, cold, and tense, and, and not fun. Also, the leaks from Harry and Meghan are often full of inaccuracies, like this headline here, the king does not have a mobile phone. According to, like, all the reliable sources out there, he doesn't have a mobile phone, so who are they texting? But what do you guys make of it all? Please leave it in the comments, and if you have any other questions about this dress, let me know. I will answer them in the next video. It was overwhelming, this dress was. It was a bad one. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I hope you enjoyed this Harry and the Meg update, and I will see you next time. Bye!